Mr. Bob Davis, thank you for sitting in with us this evening. 90, almost 94 years young. Incredible, incredible. And you served in the Navy during World War II, and you served in the Atlantic and the Pacific theaters. The first question I have to ask you is this. Now, of course, the Second World War, um, no one was quite sure at the outset what the outcome was going to be. If uh, Hitler had won that, uh, the world would certainly be a different place today. How do you respond to historians and folks in general who refer to you and your generation as the greatest one? And how do you respond to um, uh, folks who may consider you a hero for what you did during the Second World War? That's kind of cutting to the chase, but... Well, the first part of your question, yes. I think it was the greatest generation. Just the thought of losing that war, where would Hitler end it up? Sitting in the White House, <laughs> probably. Yeah. It, was one, it was a war we had to win. It was a physical war, not like so many of them are political wars, where we still lose lives. Right. And what was the other part? Being called a hero. Oh, no, I don't consider that at all. Why not? Well, it, we had a job to do and we did it. Just simple as that. That's not an uncommon response. No, uh, I think most, you've heard it before, the real heroes are the ones still over there in graves. Now, Bob, you were born in, in Ashland, Kentucky, and, and lived a part of your life in, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, before you came to Pennsylvania, but Correct. we'll get to that later. You were, what, 20 years old when you enlisted? Yes. In 1943? Yes. Why did you enlist? Because they needed us. You felt it was your patriotic duty? It was the thing to do. And why the Navy, Bob? Why the Navy? I didn't want to walk. <laughs> and they carry the heavy rifles. <laughs> Okay. Now, where do they send you for your basic training? Uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh-huh. And how was that? How were the challenges of that training? Well, it was pretty good. You learn how to do things that you never thought you'd do, mm -hmm. like marching and obeying orders, and being watched all the time. Do you feel like you were ready for that challenge when you enlisted and went to basic? I didn't know what I was ready for. <laughs> No, I didn't know it. it. It was there. How long after basic training were you shipped out? And now, I'm assuming you went to the Atlantic Theater. You went to Europe first? <coughs> yes. It was sometime late. I'm trying to figure out. Late March, I would assume. Not too long after I got out of boot camp. 1943. Yes. Mm-hmm. We went over in a convoy that I've been told was the largest at that time. Mm -hmm. And we are on a LST loaded with ammunition. And we were about in the middle of the convoy for protection. It, I mean, obviously you don't want an ammunition ship blown up. German submarines are still active. Mm -hmm. You're wearing the LST uh, cap? Are you not? Yes. Yeah, let's get a close up of that. Yeah, there it is. That was the first ship I was on. So, your emotions in, internally, uh, you're, you're leaving home, you're, you're 20 years old, you're, you're thrust in the middle of this major world conflict. How, what was going through your head at that time? How did you feel? Being well, away from family and... You didn't put too much into that. You just, it was a thrill and excitement of something different and something going on that you had no control over, but you had to do what you had to do. I did not get homesick. I had gotten homesick when I first left home after I graduated high school. So I got rid of the homesickness real early. Okay. <laughs> now, how long did you spend in the Atlantic Theater? Uh, 40, Right toward the end of 44. And then we came back as part of a nuclear crew for another LST. That was picked up in Boston after a delay. We went to the Pacific and again loaded with ammunition. 
But this time we were all alone. Mm-hmm. Nothing but sky and water day after day. Yeah. So we could see. Were you fearful? Was was it scary? No. For what some reason, scary? it wasn't. It was awesome more than scared. I see. It just made you realize how small man is in God's universe. Mm. Be on that water and just could he make a good speck from above? Now, did you experience combat on your vessel? Were you, no. were you fired upon? Did you have to fire on the enemy? Well, we did some of that. Not in the Europe, uh, not in the eastern part, but in Europe, yes. And on the going to the eastern theater of operations, it was the beginning of amassing all the power we had to invade Japan. Because Hitler had given up, and everything was being channeled over through the Suez Canal mm-hmm. and through from the states. What was your biggest challenge, if you had to think back, the, the most challenging thing you had to deal with while you were serving in the Navy, the most challenging thing for well, you personally? <laughs> having the right amount of foodstuffs. I was a cook. You were a cook? I was a cook. Ah. And <laughs> I, I always worried about getting enough of the vegetables and necessaries and it was edible. How many men were on the ship with you? Uh, about 75 to 80, and at times would be as much as 125. And we, in southern France, we served as a mothership whereby we fed the smaller boat people who didn't have food facilities and we would feed them. They'd come aboard to eat, get the chow. How, how easy is it to get to know those those 75 or so guys on, on the ship? Do you well, get to know them all pretty well? Yeah, you, yes you did, but I couldn't tell you the name of any of them right now. <laughs> did you guys stay in touch uh, years after the war? No, no, never did. No? No. I thought about it a lot of time, but it never did materialize. Okay. Besides uh, serving as a as a cook, what were some of the other duties you had to you you were assigned to uh, on on the on the ship? Pretty much, that's it. That was it. That kept you busy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We were allowed to take fresh water showers. Ah. The rest of the crew could not. They had to take salt water showers. And why was that? Because of handling the food. Ah. But I never. I never took the fresh water showers. I always showered with the crew. Uh-huh. I just didn't want to feel that different. I wanted to be with, with the regular guys. Bob, what was the most rewarding thing for you? Well, I guess getting out would rank up there pretty good, but I hesitated about staying on and then I had good reasons not to. But. I don't, can't think of any special. Did you say rank? Uh, Did you say rank? You rose to a certain rank. I rose to first class cook. First class. Okay. Uh-huh. The first, the first ship that I saw, I thought it was big as Mount Vesuvius. I'd never <laughs> seen anything bigger than a rowboat in Kentucky. <laughs> they don't have many big ships. <laughs> right. And it was awesome to look at that thing, and I was put. Things were moving pretty fast. Um, our skipper was an old Navy guy that got promoted to Gold Brick. And um, he had a lot of guys in my boat, new, young, didn't know what to do, had to be led. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was a demanding job, but you, you didn't think it was being demanding. It was just a job to do, and you did it. What you're what you're saying is 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 is, is uh, it, I, I've heard repeated by many of the guys that serve, uh, especially during your generation. It was our job. We were proud to do it, and uh, it was our duty and a sense of duty. And uh, I think uh, you find most of them that way. Yeah, yeah, it's not uncommon. Well, in a sense, we didn't have much choice. Sure. You know, those who yeah. didn't join were drafted. Right. Now, no matter whether you had to go or not had to go, one way or the other, you did. 
Was there, was there ever a dark moment for you during this time? It sounds like it was a pretty positive experience for you and exhilarating, but was there ever a dark moment? I can't think of any right offhand. Did you lose any friends? Close uh, friends? Not on my ship, no. no. Right. No. We had ships close to us that got hit, but our ship was lucky. What would you say to a young person today who, um, what, what advice would you offer to a young person that was thinking of looking to join the armed forces today? Would you recommend it? I would recommend it. Uh, I think it should have compulsory two-year military mm. for all kids. All, mm. all so when they turn 18, they should go, they should be 18, mandatory two-year service? They get an idea of what they want to do, mm -hmm. and yet they, 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 you learn them. As he used to say, you teach them right. how to respect, take orders, give orders, mm -hmm. do the right thing. So I guess that leads into my next question. You left the military, what, in 40, 40 was it 45? 45. 45. Was the, was the war over yet? Yes. The, the war against Germany? Had, yes. Germany had surrendered yeah. by then? Yes. And then you went over and to Japan the Japan had surrendered. Japan, yeah, Germany but in I, May? I, I came back based on points. Okay. Oh. You're, you're given points for different things, right. service. And I, they, were, they were trying to get rid of everybody then. Yes. But Japan had given up. Germany was already... Germany there. in May of 45 and Japan, I believe, was August. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So at that, at that point, you were, you were not thinking of making it a career? No, not seriously. Ah. It just passed my mind. The reason being, I got married during the war. Ah, you did. You were married. I married in '44. Mm -hmm. When I came back from Europe, uh, asked my, I never did really ask her. I said, "You want to get married?" And she said, "When?" <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> when? Not, not yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Um, I'm assuming, uh, Bob, by your your the way you expressed your, your your feelings about the service, that the skills and the experience that you picked up served you well throughout life. Am I wrong? Oh yes, oh mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. That's one reason I think it would be good for the compulsory two-year term that I mentioned. We had a baker on board ship. Well, he was a cook and a baker both, but he. He was older than most of us, and he had a restaurant in Dallas. And when we were coming back from, uh, from uh, the east, he wanted me to come see him in Dallas. He had a job for me as a cook, so he liked what I did. I see. And he was he, he could take nothing to make it taste good. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty good. But then you you were telling me before the interview you wound up in in the oil industry too, working for Standard well, Oil. Yeah, yeah, I was with them. Uh, I took some courses, night courses, after I couldn't get back into college. Uh, for due to my job with credit and collections and applications for people. And I worked in the credit department, and eventually I worked in several different fields in, within the company. I see. You were, you were married? You had how many children? Three children. Three children. Grandchildren? Six. Uh-huh. Eight great. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Let me ask you this: You're, you're also a, you're also considered the, the chaplain at your at your at this VFW post. Am I correct? Yes. And uh, and uh, so you're still in a sense you're still serving the guys decades later. Uh, you know, and not only World War II vets. There's there's still some of you left, of course, but uh, even the guys from uh, Korea and Vietnam and the wars that followed. Uh, you know, those those years as well. It's an interesting it's an interesting uh, point. Well, it, it, to me, war is war. Yes. Ernie Pyle described it best. Yes. I know you remember Ernie Pyle. Ernie Pyle. He was in Europe, and he wrote 
columns that everybody loved to read so when they found out where their boyfriends and sons were. And then it seems to the Pacific, and as I heard, remember the story, he was asked, which war is the worst? And he, his reply was, each man's war is the worst. Each man's war is the worst. I thought it's such a good description. Mm -hmm. my, war is, my war is worse than yours. Mm -hmm. Yours is worse than mine. Mm -hmm. It's where you are and where you're dodging bullets. <laughs> Bob, um, two final questions. One, I got a lot of uh, middle school and high school students will be, will be tuning into this interview. Uh, some of the students that I teach are, are, are termed at risk. Uh, they may be struggling with addiction or, you know, uh, <clears throat> family issues and what have you and facing some really serious challenges in life. Um, what would you say to a young man or a young woman who looks to the future and really doesn't see much for themselves? They, 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 they maybe don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and wondering where they're going to wind up in, in a couple of years. What would you say to them that, uh, to kind of get them back on track or to give them hope? After, after the experiences that you've, you've uh, For me endured. personally, I think it would be very difficult to get the point across. But as someone who's more learned than I am, uh, I think possibly you might be very good at that. And possibly you, you may do it. Uh, some people just have a knack to get into somebody's head and know mm -hmm. what they can do mm -hmm. and get them on the right path. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to think maybe I've I've helped a couple, three along the way, but I'm not sure. I say, fair enough, fair enough. What, what does, what does a 93 year old, almost 94 years old, your birthday's coming up in a couple of months. What do you do with your time these days? Well, I belong to the Optimist Club. Ha. Uh, which tells you a little something about me. Yes. I belong to the Legion. I belong to the fire company. Been a member of a volunteer fire company for 53 years now. 53 years volunteer fire. Um, on the board of directors, I happen to be chairman of the board, and uh, I do a little cooking of oh, cookies. I spread the spread the wealth about cookies. Huh. I do that uh, quite a bit. Okay, so so you're in the Optimist Club. So being an being an optimist, then I mean that that might that might. Uh... Well, offer offer a clue to some of the young people that are looking it, for uh, it does because we our slogan is friend of youth friend of youth yes when it was originally started back about 1920 or something it was friend of the delinquent boy uh huh then it was changed to 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 the boy and now it all includes girls certainly we have. Essay contest, oratorical contest, basketball skills, different things. And we, we get through to a lot of them. We have people that are growing up and they remember. Mm -hmm. We have a youth of the month huh. from the school. So you are actively involved in yeah. giving young people hope and giving well, them... Well, yes, yes. Yeah. I kind of thought I didn't think about well, that. Well, there at you the go. Time. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> Any final words for us, Bob? Again, we, we want to thank you for your service and we thank you for your time here today, but uh, anything else that maybe I've left out? There's, there's so much I'd love to ask you. But well, there's... there's a whole lot I could tell you <laughs> on a personal note, uh, but I have nothing special. Just work hard, have fun, do your job. Thank you, Bob Davis, You're for welcome. your time and for your service. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.